good to see you here this morning. If I could get you to uh, to stand with me this morning as we sing our our new song for the month, and it is uh, uh, it is called "You Are God Alone." <laughs> each and every one that's come this morning. Lord, we're thankful that you are God alone, that nobody is equal to you and your power and your knowledge and your grace and goodness and your justice and holiness. God, you are God alone. I'm thankful this morning that we as your people, Lord, can come and we can worship you and lift you up, Lord, in song, but also, Lord, as we hear from your word, Lord, we can lift you up in our lives as we are obedient to your Holy Spirit. And as we live out the gospel, 
each and every day in our lives. God, help us to do that. Lord, give us strength, give us courage, and Lord, give us confidence, confidence in Christ. And Lord, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for uh, all your many blessings. Thank you for the guests that we have with us this morning. We're so appreciative to have them with us. God, we pray that this would be a day that uh, you are pleased with and that you are honored. And we ask all these things in the name of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Tracy's going to come and lead us in some more songs. If you are visiting with us, we do count a privilege to have you. If you're joining us by live stream and you're visiting with us today, it's a privilege to have you as well. But if you're here in the pew in front of you, it's a little card. If you'll fill that out, drop it in the offering plate later. That'll just help us to connect with you a little more. All right. Tom, Tommy, have we have we seen the grandbaby? Yeah. Has she been here? Yeah. Okay. All right. I was, Remember I, the burp in the park? The burp. All right. I I always say that's all right. That's all right. We like that stuff. Uh, you know, my my granddaughter's going to be here today, uh, Adriana, and she just turned eighteen and just graduated. And uh, when she when we first brought her here, she was that size, and I I held her up like I had you guys do. I held her up like the Lion King man and held her out. I can't do that anymore. Uh, but uh, uh, it's just exciting to see uh, new ones born and, and as they grow, and, and it's just a, it's just a great thing. Uh, it's even even when you're sending them to the room. Uh, when they get older, you know, because you can't take them no more. They're so disrespectful and everything, but that's not going to happen to you guys. <laughs> All right, uh, mansion over the hilltop. I'm satisfied with just the kind of below.
Jesus is speaking of the tribulation. Saints, it will survive. So we are not to be afraid of what's going on in the world. We should not be afraid of anything, really, even though fear does creep in. But we know who is in the world and doing this. And I won't even say his name. The devil is powerful, so he thinks, and his time is short. And even though the song I'm going to sing is a Christmas song, I think it's relevant for today. It's called O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, O Israel, to you shall come, Emmanuel. Oh, come thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by your advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to light. Rejoice, rejoice, O Israel, to you shall come Emmanuel. O come thou wisdom from on high, and order all things far and nigh. To us the path of knowledge show, and cause us in her ways to go. Rejoice, rejoice, O Israel, to you shall come, Emmanuel. O come, desire of nations and bind in one the hearts of all mankind. Be thou our sad division cease, and be thyself our King of peace. Rejoice, rejoice, O Israel, to you shall come, Emmanuel. Amen. It's all right, our kids are going to head out to junior worship as they're doing that. Man, I, just, man, I love what the scripture says. It says that Jesus is the light of the Gentiles and the hope of his people and the glory of his people, Israel. And so, man, often we, we quote the Bible verse that says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, right? And I think sometimes we get in our head that that peace for Jerusalem is somehow, you know, peace from war, that they would be guarded and, and, and kept from war or taken out. But can I really tell you what the gist of that verse is? It's pray for Israel that they would recognize their Messiah, Jesus Christ. Because he is the Prince of Peace. And he's the one that brings peace even in the midst of whatever circumstances. And so, man, that's what you can pray for most of all. Yes, pray for Israel as they're fighting battles and as they're, they've got enemies on different fronts. Pray for that. But ultimately, pray for the people of Israel that they would come to know Jesus as their Messiah. I don't know if you realize it or not, but over 90% of those living in Israel today will be qualified as unbelievers. They do not believe that Jesus is their Messiah. And so we need to pray for that. There are some, 
And there are missionaries there in Israel as well who are reaching people with the gospel and there are stories coming in each and every day of how uh, different people are turning to and recognizing their Messiah. But just like here in America, we need to pray and our goal is the gospel, that people might have true hope in Christ. So as we are turning today in Scripture, turn to Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 10 this morning. We're going to be there. We're going to be looking at the blessings of life for all. The blessings of life for all. Now today is a little bit of a special day um, because we're honoring uh, seniors within our, uh, not senior citizens, but seniors as in those who are graduating from either high school or college this year. Within our congregation we have Lydia, uh, our daughter, is graduating, had graduated from high school. Now, usually we do this in the summer, but man, I'm so busy. Didn't get a plan, but we're doing it now. Uh, better late than never, right? So we're we're honoring uh, seniors today. I think next year Jacob will be a, a senior graduating from college, so we'll look forward to that next year, honoring him and, and anybody else. But but this message today is kind of to her as well as to all of us, because it's talking about here in Proverbs chapter ten. It really points out three blessings of life that is available to all. Now, as we as we get into this, as we think about it, I, I've got. I'm gonna take you back for a minute. Look back in your memory. Remember the first job you had, the fir very first job that you had. Not, I'm not talking about doing chores and that kind of thing. I'm talking about the first official job, right, that you had. Remember what that was like. Remember uh, being able to earn money, and remember what the the, the satisfaction of a, a job well done. As you did that job, well, let's let's just hold the audience for a minute. Let's see, just a few of you. What was your first job? Anybody over here? All right, Julie. Telephone operator. Oh, Linda, telephone operator. Okay. I worked in a pickle factory. In a pickle factory. <laughs> My daughter Maris would love that. She loves pickles. <laughs> I don't know if you'd love it after working in the factory for so long. <laughs> All right, anybody else over here? All right, then. Jewelry department at Woolworth. All right, let's see. Paper route guys. Paper route. All right. Yeah. How about over here? We got any, all right, Charlotte? Fuddruckers is the hostess. Hostess at Fuddruckers. Man, those have went by. I don't even know if they're around anymore. I think they're <laughs> gone. Man, that's that's cool. Anybody else over here? I was worked at a car hop. You were a car hop? The roller skates. At A&W or roller. some other place? No, it was in Indianapolis. Local. Okay. Nice. All right, anybody else on this side? First job, first job. All right, Sandy? Cleaning hotels. Cleaning hotels. Custodian, all right. Just bring Babysitter. <laughs> Say it again? Babysitter. Babysitter, all right, yes, all right. So we've all had different first jobs. And you think about that job. For me, my first job was I worked for my dad. He did a, he had his own uh, small HVAC company, and so I went to work for him and, and helped out with installs and and cleaning air conditioning units. So that was my first job. Lydia's first job has been working at Applebee's and she just loves it. <laughs> She's learned some things about working there at Applebee's, but no, she really does enjoy it. But um, really, we, we think about that first job and we think about what that meant and the things that we learned there. But can I tell you what, really, you're, I want to talk to you today a little bit about the glory of work. There's glory in work. And, and working and doing things with your own hands. And whether you realize it or not, you started to learn about the glory of work when you started doing household chores as a little kid and going to school and working on projects and stuff like that. Because one of the things you might have realized when you started doing household chores is there were certain jobs that you really didn't like. And you were like, I don't want to do that for the rest of my life, right? Like washing dishes. How many love to wash dishes? I don't think anybody does. My son will go in there and when it's his turn to wash dishes, he'll go, man, uh, I hate washing dishes. I'm going to join the club. Nobody likes, I don't know anybody that loves washing dishes. <laughs> All right? But uh, you, you learn what, hey, you know what? I don't want to spend the rest of my life washing dishes or whatever it is that you find out you don't want to do. So that's helpful. And maybe it's the, the pride of recognition for a job well done. That, maybe you remember that first time that you did something, and maybe it was a household chore, maybe it was a school project or whatever, presentation, you did it, and there was recognition given. 
hey, that was great. Hey, you did a, you did a good job. And the feeling in your heart, that, man, yes, I did a good job, man. I pleased my parents or I, I pleased my teacher or whatever. There, there's that, that recognition, that satisfaction in your heart for a job. Well, there is glory in work. And then there's the hardships of labor, right? You learn those too. Sometimes because uh, of others and their lack maybe of, of a work ethic or whatever, and you have to work with them and it can get difficult sometimes. Maybe it's because you make some foolish choices in your, in your work and maybe you cut a corner here or something and you realize, oh, I should have done that. It makes things harder. Boy, this is getting difficult. All right, and so there's the hardships, but can I tell you, really, work is a blessing, and that's the first thing I want to point out to you today, is the blessing of work. Look with me at Proverbs 10, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. If you remember, when we looked at Proverbs chapter 9, we talked about that chapter 9 gave us the blueprint for the rest of Proverbs, that as you go through Proverbs, it is a comparison between the wise man and the foolish man. The wise choice and the foolish choice. Each time it's presented. And this is the same here as we kick it off in, in, in chapter 10 of Proverbs. There is the comparison of the wise and the foolish son. Verse 2. The treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to vanish, but he casteth away the substance of the wicked. Look at verse 4. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. But the hand of the diligent maketh rich. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. Now look at these first seven verses here in Proverbs chapter 10, and they deal primarily with the blessing of work. And I tell you, work is a blessing. It's not a curse. Working is not a curse. Sometimes we get that in our mind, that working is a curse. But it's not. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Verse 18 and 19. Turn back there with me. Or you can look up on the screen. Genesis 3, 18 and 19. Adam and Eve are in the garden. And they have said, they've, they've taken of that uh, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God had told them not to. And in that, here, this is the midst of what God's telling is the consequences for what they did. It says, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it thou wast, wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Shalt thou return. Now notice, did you see anywhere in there where he said, now, Adam, you got to work? That's a curse? No. Because not. Can I tell you what? Adam had a job before they sinned and took of that tree. Adam's job was he was to care for the Garden of Eden. He was to care for it. He was to see to it. He was to, to oversee it. And so he worked. He had a job. And there was glory in it. And you know what? There was satisfaction as God would come down and meet with him in the cool of the day, him and, and, and Eve. And, and they would, and, and, and God would say, you're doing a good job. Well done, Adam. Well done, Eve. You're doing a great job. The work was not a curse. Work is a gift. It's a blessing. To be able to work with your hands. It, and in some ways, it's almost a reflection of your creator God. Who created this world out of nothing. With his hands, so to speak. We get to create with the things that God has given us. And we get to do things. And we get to build things. And it's a blessing. It's a blessing to be able to do it. The curse is that now their work would be difficult. Now their work would be more difficult because of, again, primarily, since his job is working with the land, man, there's going to be weeds and thistles. It's going to be tough. You're going to have to really work that land. And so it wasn't work that was the curse. It was the more difficulty in work. But notice what it said there in verse 4. It says that, he becometh poor that dealeth the slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Man, work is a blessing. Can I tell you what it does? As you work, it staves off death. Can I tell you what? We're all going to die. Unless Jesus comes back, all right, and raptures us away, we're all going to die. 
10 out of 10 people die. It's just fact of life. But can I tell you what? Some people die sooner than others. There's different reasons for that, but one of the things is I notice, you ever, I've had people comment to me before and go, you know, man, I just, uh, man, I just can't get around, you know, and, and I'm not talking about really older people, I'm talking about sometimes they're, they're not that really older, all right? And, 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 and I made the statement before, and I know that I've heard this statement made before, if you, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? Movement. You, you got to keep moving. You got to keep doing things. Work is one of those things that helps us to keep doing things. Keep going. Keep, and so, man, it might be the work of an official job. It might be the work of a, of a, a hobby of building something. But whatever. Work is something that staves off death. It staves off, man, the, the bones and the, and the joints freezing up. Because work is a blessing. There is glory in work. It enhances your memories. Man, you know what, if all we, a lot of times if you think back to the things that you remember, you do remember the big times in life, maybe the birth of a child or, or getting married and those type of things. But often, um, other things that we, there are a lot of things that we went through, things that we did, things that were nice, things that were fun or whatever. And a lot of those things you don't remember very much anymore. But can I tell you what, other things that you remember? When you did a project or something and you succeeded, and or you did it well, you remember that. You remember what that was like. So man, it enhances our memories. Work is is a is a blessing. It's not a curse. And work involves diligently planning ahead and accomplishing the task that makes one grow and mature and be satisfied physically, mentally, and spiritually. Look at verse five. He that gathered in summer is a wise son. But he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. Lydia, other young people, man, us, those of us as adults, man, as, as we set out to live this thing called life, work well. Man, focus your heart and, and realize that work is a blessing that's been given to you. It's something that you can, you can dream and you can do things that God calls you to do, and you can work at them, and you can experience joy, you can experience satisfaction, you can experience growth and maturity through that work. Man, and plan ahead. Think ahead. Think about what God wants you to do. Think about what, what your life has planned before you, what God has for you, and follow His plan. And that involves looking ahead. It involves having a vision. It involves dreaming. Thinking about what, where God is leading you and then acting in accordance to that. But it involves diligent planning ahead. That's what it says here. Man, man he that gathered in the summer, man, before the winter hits, man, he's already planning. He's gathering the fruits so that he can, he can survive the winter. But the slothful one, the foolish son, he just sleeps around the day. Doesn't do anything. So he's not prepared when the winter hits. So the blessing of work. Colossians 3.23 says this, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Well, whatever you do, man, do it for God. That means that your job, your career, is to be done as unto the Lord. It's not unto your boss. It's not unto your paycheck. It's not unto you. It's unto the Lord. Ultimately, first thing, you're, you do work as unto the Lord, to bring Him glory, to be a testimony for Him. But to experience the blessing of work, for God to work in you and through you, it's one of the ways that He hones you and that He gifts you and that He, he grows you and matures you, not only physically, not only mentally, but spiritually as well. And I tell you what, work is a spiritual thing. You say, well, my muscles tell me it's a lot physical. Yeah, well, it's physical too. But it's a spiritual thing. Why? Because God designed us to work. God designed us that we would use our hands, that we would work and we would do things and build things. Look at verse 3. There's a promise here to the glory and the blessing of work. It says that the Lord himself guarantees that you will experience the blessing of work. So the Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish. Man, if you work hard and you follow the Lord and you 
carry out the calling and the gifts that he's placed on your life and you do your job well, God says, I will not allow you to be famished. But he casteth away the substance of the wicked. The wicked or foolish man who, go, who sets out to, to work as minimal as he can and to get away with just being lazy and sluggish, man, God says even that that he hath will be cast out. So as you seek life, man, seek one of the greatest blessings that's available to all. And that is the blessing of work. It is like a crown. Work is. In verse 6 it says, blessings are upon the head of the just. The work is like a crown upon our head. But I think about this fact that God's the God has guaranteed and he promises that the righteous as they work, that, that they will not be famished. I mean, I think of Abraham. Abraham back in, in Genesis, you don't have to turn there, but for the sake of time today, Abraham, he had, he had gone through some things and some circumstances and he was somewhat beat down and discouraged. His nephew Lot had said, well, Abraham, I don't really want much to do with you. I'm going to go over here where it looks like things are good and I'm going to go do my thing and see you later, uncle. Right? And that's what he did. And so Abraham's going through some tough times. And, and you know what? All of a sudden he gets news that, hey, they've come and they've taken prisoner. Your, your nephew Lot. And so Abraham, man, he, he gathers together his, his servants and, he, and, they, and forms a little army. And they go after it and they rescue Lot. Man, they, are, they fight and they gain the day. They win the day. And so Abraham... Uh, rescues Lot. And a king, the king of Sodom comes along. And the king of Sodom, man, he's a foolish man. Abraham's a wise man. He's serving God. He's looking to God. The king of Sodom, not so much. He's really foolish. Man, all he sees is, man, look at the spoils of war. And he didn't do a lot. Abraham's the one that did the work. All right, Abraham and his servants. But the king of Sodom comes along and says, hey, Abraham, look at the spoils of war. Hey, you want some of this? And Abraham I don't need that. I just want what God has for me. You tell you what? God blessed Abraham. Because the next king that comes along in the story is the king of Salem, Melchizedek. And the Bible tells us that he lays out a feast before Abraham, and he ministers to Abraham, and Abraham is satisfied, and he has peace. And all that comes because, man, he is following the Lord. And he doesn't listen to the king of Sodom. You know what the king of Sodom does? I mean, he picks up his spoils and he goes back to Sodom, not knowing that in just a few short years, the judgment of heaven is going to come upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And even that, that the foolish and wicked man has, will be cast out. As God rains down uh, fire and brimstone upon those two cities in judgment for their wickedness. And so that's a story, that's an event from Scripture that we can see that verse played out. That God did not allow uh, Abraham to, to be famished, but God provided. God gave him the victory. God gave him peace. You see, you make the choice of whether you labor or work. You can work and experience the glory of it. Or you can labor. Just get away with what you think you have to do. Cut corners. And you know what? You will experience the blessing of work. You'll experience even that that you have being cast out. I, I, I've heard people say this phrase, and I think it's a very, uh, a very important phrase. That if you get a hold of it, man, your life, and especially in this area of work, will be blessed. It's the, it's the phrase, I've never worked a day in my life. Why do they say that? Because what they did is they found what they loved. They recognize their gifts and they spend their life doing what they love for work. Hey, young people, that's you. Hey, adults, maybe you're maybe you're arriving and you're like, man, I don't really like the job I'm in. Well, what's the gifts you have? What is it that you love to do? Maybe step out by faith and go, I'm gonna do that. And I don't want to just spin my wheels doing what I hate doing. I'm going to do what I love to do. Go to work and experience the glory and the blessing of work. And I guarantee it, you'll never work a day in your life. It'll be a blessing. Number two is this. 
we have the blessing of words. Not only do we have the blessing of work, but we have the blessing of words. Look at verse 11. The mouth of a righteous man is a what? A well of life. But violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. And then we can skip up to verses 20 and 21. The tongue of the just is as choice silver, and the heart of the wicked is little worth. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for want of wisdom. There's the blessing of words. Words, we're told in Proverbs chapter 10, are a well, a source of life. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. You see, words, your words can be a blessing. They can be a source of life. You can speak words that bring encouragement, bring peace, bring satisfaction to others. Or you can speak words that tear down, that cause anger. And so it's your choice. We can choose to experience the blessing of words and to speak life, to, to study the word of God and to carry out his word and to obey it. I, mean, I love this hymn, this old hymn. It's called Wonderful Words of Life. It's by Philip Bliss. He was a Methodist composer. Some of you might know this hymn, but it's, it went like this. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words. Wonderful words of life. You see, words are a blessing. Words can be a blessing. Now, there's some caveats. So, number one, verse eight, it, it tells us that the wise in heart will receive commandments. Words must be received. If they're going to be a blessing, you must receive the word of God. You must receive the instruction that people give you, the commands that are given, those righteous things that are given to you, the encouragement. You must receive those words in order for them to be a blessing. Not only that, but it must be your words must ring true. Look at um, verse 9. He that walketh uprightly walketh surely, but he that perverteth his way shall be known. You see, what does that mean? It means if you walk in truth, your words are truth, you seek to speak truth, and as much as is within you, you make sure that you're not speaking lies, but you're speaking truth, you'll walk in confidence. You don't have to doubt what you said. You don't have to think back and go, did I say that right? Did, did I? You don't have to wonder. You can walk in confidence because your words are true. Not so for the, the wicked, the one who perverted his ways. How does he do that? Because he speaks lies. He speaks lies. Can I tell you what? If, if you're out there and you're spreading the lies and, well, man, I don't think God, man, I'm going to tell a little lie here. You know what's eventually going to happen? You're going to be caught in your lie. You can't walk confidently because you're constantly going, oh man, I told this lie, man. I gotta keep this up. Man, I told this lie over here, I gotta keep this up. Man, I told this lie here, and I gotta keep this up. How am I gonna do that? Man, you can't remember what you said. You can't remember because you didn't speak the truth and, and you lied, and now you're constantly, you can't walk in surety because your words have been lies. Man, not only that, but words can be a blessing if they're measured. Look at verse 10. He that winketh with the eye causeth sorrow, but a priding fool shall fall. What does that mean? Well, we've all kind of been there and somebody's kind of maybe playing a trick on us and they tell us something and maybe maybe you caught it every once in a while, corner their eye, there's somebody else there and they just kind of wink at them because they're, you know, kind of playing a joke or a little thing on you. And they tell you something and you're like, you're falling for it. All right? You know, a little innocent, that's okay, and it, it can, maybe sometimes that can be done in a mischievous way to actually be malicious and cause sorrow. But even greater is the fact of the foolish man. The foolish man just goes around babbling and he's got, I call it diarrhea of the mouth. Blah, 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 blah. And they just keep babbling and they just keep babbling. They don't even know what they're talking about, but they got, they got something to say for everything that's going to be said, right? <clears throat> Those words won't be a blessing. It says there that a prating fool shall fall. It shall be their downfall. Words will be a blessing if you walk above the gossip and drama in life. Look at verse 12. Hatred stirs up strifes, 
but love covereth all sins. You know, the gossip, the reason why I love the gossip often is because it's about, it's something negative about somebody else, usually. Ooh, it, they're down. Ooh, look what, did you hear what they did? And you like to gossip about it. You like to tell other people about it. Because, ooh, it's going to make them look bad and make me look good. It really doesn't make you look good, but that's what you think. And so you gossip, and you get up, caught up in the drama of life. Don't do that. Be, walk above that. And then you walk above that. When you're at the job, young people, hey, adults, and, and, and over by the water cooler, they're over there, and they're gossiping. And, no, don't, don't give into that. Walk above that. Why? Because that doesn't bring life. Words are meant to be a blessing. God gave us the ability to speak. Man, animals can't speak like we can, but we have language and we can speak words and words can be alive, but they must be true and they must not, we must not get caught up in the gossip and drama of life. You see, the blessing of words covereth all sins. We don't make it our job to point out the defaults and the defects and the sins of others. If, that's, if you think that God called you and that's your spiritual gift, let me let you in on a secret. It's not. That's not a spiritual gift. That you can gossip and, and, and be full of all the drama. No, that's not a spiritual gift. Walk away from it. And then words must be taken to heart. Words must come from the heart. Truly, words that are a blessing, they come from the heart. They've been considered. Verse 17 says, He is in the way of life that keepeth instruction. But he that refuses reproof, error. When you've taken words to heart, whether words said to you or words that you say before you say them, you, you measure them in your heart, you take them to heart, and you speak from your heart. Man, that is the way of life. But he that refuses that, refuses the words that are given, spoken to him, refuses to even think about his words and just blab whatever. Man, it is his error. To his ways. Words hold their value. Just as words are, just words are as the best precious metals, and they fulfill many. Look at verse 20 again. The tongue of the just says choice silver. Your words of the just man, they're like choice silver. They're precious. They hold value. But the words, the heart of the wicked, is of little worth. Can I tell you, words hold their value whether they're positive or negative. Positive words hold great value. They're like precious metals or precious ore. Diamonds, gold, silver, that's what they're like. But foolish words, can I tell you what? They're negative, but they hold their value too. It's just a negative value. Many times, they're never forgotten. Foolish words produce folly in abundance. I'm reminded of the story of a, a father and his daughter. His daughter had been involved with a particularly little incident of gossip. And the, the father was talking with his daughter and he was sharing with her about, you know, you, you really ought to watch your words. You know, the, the things you say, man, they are, they are hurtful. And he said, hey, he said, hey, come, come with me. And he grabbed the pillow of their house and they walked out of their house and it, it was a blustery day. The wind was blowing. And they went up to this cliff near their house. He took his daughter away and said, now, I want you to do something. And he took his knife out and he cut that pillow open. He said, now, I want you to take this pillow and I want you to just dump the contents of that pillow in the air. And she took that pillow and she, and the feathers of that pillow went flying out and the wind blew them and they went out over and they blew out over the countryside as they looked down upon it. And then her dad said, now, I want you to go. I want you to pick up all those feathers. And the daughter looked at them. That's impossible. And her dad said, yeah, be careful of our words. We can, once you say something, you can make apologies you can do things, but you can never take all of it back. You can never take all of it back. The things that you say that are hurtful, that are gossip, that are untruths, 
And you can do what you can, but you never make up for a time. And so that was the lesson that the father taught his daughter that day. That's a lesson for us. I mean, our words, they hold their value. If it's positive, great, they bring life. They are precious. Man, they can, as verse 21 says, they can feed many. But if they're negative, man, they are of little worth and people, fools, will die because of them. Romans 3, 13 through 15 says this. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. It matches up well with the descriptions we're given here in Proverbs chapter 10. But that, that throat, that speech. Man, Romans, he's, he's talk, Paul's talking there saying, man, man's speech is an open sepulcher. It's full of deceit and poison as asked. And so you say, man, how are words a blessing? Because God designed language and he gave us language. But in our sinfulness, man, our language is spoiled. Our hearts are spoiled. And we need the gospel. And I return to that song, Wonderful Words of Life. And the next verse goes like this. Christ, the blessed one, gives to all. Wonderful words of life. Sinner, list to the loving call. Wonderful words of life. Also freely given, wooing us to heaven. Sweetly echo the gospel call. Wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all. Wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. You say, Pastor Sean, man, how can I experience the blessing of words? You can experience it by, by, number one, coming to faith in Christ. If you don't know Christ as your Savior this morning, that is the, the greatest thing that you can do is heed the words from this Bible and from my lips this morning and put your faith and trust in Jesus as your only Savior. He died for you. And you know what he died to do? To make the God-designed speech of your life, a blessing. A blessing to you and a blessing to others. Man, God, Jesus Christ can do that. That's why the gospel is our hope. Man, all of our life is messed. It's not just our speech. Man, it's our thoughts, man. It's our heart. It's who we are. Even our physical lives, man. We are, the, the, the reality of life is that we're dying every day. Our, our bodies are running down because of the effect of sin. But Jesus is our hope. He's come to give us life. He's come to supersede all that and to, to give you the blessing of language, to give you the blessing of peace in your heart, to give you the blessing of not being a slave to sin and having an eternal destination and purpose in Christ. James 3, 5 and 6 says, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth, and the tongue is a fire, a war of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, 8 and 10, that defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. But the tongue can no man tame, it is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brother, these things ought not to be so. Can I tell you what? On your own, you will be like a foolish man, and your words will be of worthless value. But in Christ, he can take your words, and they can be a great blessing, and a great help, and a source of life. There's one more blessing. There's the blessing of word. There's the blessing of words. They're available to all. It's your choice today. But number three, there's the blessing of waiting. Verses 23 through 32. We'll just look at verses 28 and 29. The hope of the righteous shall be gladness. But the expectation of the wicked shall perish. The way of the Lord is strength to the upright, but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. You ever heard this phrase? If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. The blessing of waiting. Sometimes in life, we need to take advantage of just waiting. Patience. There's blessing in it. Keep your eyes on the prize and watch your dreams materialize. That's the idea of here of in verse 28. The hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. Keep your eyes on what God's called you to. 
Whatever career that may be, whatever life God's called you and purpose God's called you to, keep your eyes on it. And there's a blessing of waiting. Sometimes you just got to wait. Sometimes God says, hold on. The next door is not ready for you yet. I'm going to open it, but in my time, and you've got to wait. Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Galatians 5, 5 says, for we in the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. In life, if we're not careful, we can get impatient. We realize, man, man, I, man, I have this dream. I have a vision of what God wants me to do. And, and we get impatient and we don't wait on God. And we want to do our own thing. And if we're not careful, man, we run headlong in two. And we throw open doors that God's not ready for us to go through yet. And we face difficulty and trial of our own pain. Because sometimes we just need to wait. The blessing of waiting. Sometimes it's boredom. We get bored in life at some times. Because we lose our focus. And we get bored. And, and it, verse 23 says, It is a sport to a fool to do mischief, but a man of understanding hath wisdom. We can get bored. And when we're bored, we're enticed to do mischief or evil. Right? The devil, the, 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 the idle mind is the devil's workshop, right? If we're not careful, the blessing of waiting. Waiting doesn't mean doing nothing. It means actively doing what God's already revealed to you to do and wait for him to take the next step. It means watch out for rash decisions. Look at verse 24. The fear of the wicked, it shall come upon him. But the desire of the righteous shall be granted. Rash decisions out of fear brings upon us the very things we fear. You know, the, the fearful man who fears this, they, they, they get so focused on that, and they start making irrational decisions, maybe about work, maybe about life, whatever, and they start making these rash decisions, and before law, the very thing that they fear comes upon them. That's what Proverbs is saying. That don't make rash decisions. And trust in the Lord. Wait on Him. Let God's Word direct you. But focusing on faith, on the faithful one, brings reward. Brings reward. It said there, it said, but the desire of the righteous shall be granted. If you're focused on Christ and you're waiting on Him and walking in His way, you know what? You'll be rewarded. Not only that we need to keep our eyes on the prize, but we also sometimes just need to act slower. And be slower, precise action leads to joy, while hurried, settling action leads to junk. <clears throat> Look with me at verse 26. As vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to them that sin him. You see, sometimes we get impatient. And maybe we make decisions and we entrust things to someone who we really don't know well. And the results can be disastrous. Or sometimes we are so impatient and we, we know where we want to go. We know where we're headed and we want to get there. We want to get there so quick that we'll entrust somebody who's undependable who's not maybe necessarily trustworthy. Oh, we've heard somebody tell us, oh, I'd be careful about it. And we go, oh, well, I know better. And you would trust something in them and it becomes disastrous. <coughs> the idea of that there is vinegar to the teeth. As smoke to the eyes, smoke irritates the eyes. So is that sluggard who you entrust a job to or whatever. Man, he's, he's like smoke to the eyes. He's irritating. It's annoying. Psalm 37, 3 says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Man, don't, don't look at the world around you and think, well, man, man, look at, look at, man, why are they getting ahead? And, and yet, God, you call me here, and man, I seem to be sometimes spinning my wheels. Just wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. God's got something greater for you. Man, that person that you see that you think is prospering so well, you don't always see the other side of their life. 
and the trauma and the, and, the, and the destruction that's going on in their life. And the discouragement and the despair that they face. And so today, man, I want to encourage you. There's the blessing of waiting. Isaiah 40, verse 30 and 31 says this. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. We think it's sometimes as we get older, man, man I struggle. Man, I'm weary. They tell you what, young people can be weary too. You can be weary in the things and the circumstances of this world. Man, I don't know how many times lately I've heard people say, you know what, man, it's got to be tough for young people today. And in some ways, yes. But, man, God is still God. God is still at work. The Bible says, as it continues in Isaiah 40, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You see, all of us have the opportunity to be blessed in life. Every one of us. But all of us choose to live blessed. Hey, you want to live a blessed life? Choose the blessing of work. Choose the blessing of words. Choose the blessing of waiting and trusting God. One last thing I want to point out to you, verse 22 in Proverbs 10. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. You see, the Bible reminds us that when God blesses our life, when our eyes are focused on him, Hey, young person, when you're focused on the Lord and his path for you, and you're following him, can I tell you what? As God blesses you, his blessings have no downside. There's no cons to God's blessings. They are pros all the way. Be careful. Keep your focus on him. Enjoy the blessings that God gives. Don't envy the foolish or the wicked man who seems to be gaining because the blessings that aren't really blessings that they get, they have lots of cons and, this, and it destroys their lives. Man, what this world will call a blessing can bring down your life, but what God gives as a blessing has no downside. And it enriches you and gives you joy. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray you help us today. God, we thank you for progress.